Uh, welcome to Higher Structures uh, Seminar Series of Feza Gürsey Center for Physics and Mathematics. Today our speaker is Elena Dimitriadis Bermejo from uh, Institute de Mathematique de Toulouse, Université Paul Sabatier. Uh, and uh, she will talk on a new model for DG categories. So we thank uh, Elena for uh, being one of the speakers in our seminar series please. Uh, thank you very much. So before I start, I wanted to uh, thank the organizers of this seminar for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, of course, just wanted to reiterate, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to stop me. Uh, whether it is a follow-up question or if you want me to say something in more detail about something I'm talking about. So uh, the subject of the, the, the talk today will be the subject of my, of my PhD thesis, which is a new model for DG categories. Mm. Now, DG categories have been very useful over the years, especially in domains like algebraic geometry, where the classical categories are not necessarily enough to do everything we need them to do, because geometry has this notion of linearity that cat normal categories don't have, but that DG categories do. But DG categories are not perfect either. It, among other things, they have a model structure and they have a monoidal structure, but the two of them are not compatible. A, an example of that is that the product of two cofibrant objects is not necessarily cofibrant. So in order to solve this problem, people over the years have been trying to find other models, so other definitions of DG categories that might work better and solve some of these issues. And in order to do that in the last uh, decade to 15 years, one of the ways they have done that has been taking inspiration, inspiration in infinity categories. So let us do a um, little bit of a uh, sidewalk and let's talk a tiny little bit about the history of infinity categories. Now, the first definition of an infinity category was due to Dwyer and Kahn in 1980, where they introduced simplicial localizations, which is a particular case of simplicial categories. Now, Simplicial categories are very good, but they have the same problem as digit categories have, which is they have a model structure and they have a monoidal structure, but the two of them don't combine uh, properly. So over the years, people have tried and find other solutions. So for example, people have uh, reused Vormann and Vogt's uh, quasi-categories that were first defined in 73. Then Dwyer, Kahn, and Smith introduced Siegel categories, which are closer in definition to simplicial categories in 89. And then in 2001, Gresk introduced complete Siegel spaces. Now I have said that all of these are models for infinity categories. But the formal proof of that will have to wait until 2007, where Berner on one hand and Rael and Derny on the other hand prove that these models are quill and equivalent, meaning that we have model structures on them, and then we can prove that those model structures are all equivalent. Now, what happens in the case of DG categories? Well, if infinity categories have a proud uh, history, DG categories are even older. We have people already using them in the 60s. 
but we will have to wait all the way until 2005 for Taboada to construct a model structure on them. And we can realize this problem again with the monoidal case. So in the last, again, 10, 15 years, people have been trying to find other models. First of all, we have Kohn in uh, 2013 that proves that DG categories are equivalent as quasi-categories to K-linear quasi-categories. Now, this is a very nice result, but as anyone who has ever worked with K-linear ca quasi-categories in Lurisense can tell you, they're not very user-friendly. They have a lot of background that needs to be covered before we can actually define things. Some results that are pretty much self-evident in the normal definition of DG categories become really hard. It's not very practical. So then we have in uh, 2015, Gebner and Hausgern defined enriched quasi-categories. In 2020, Bagar defines DG Siegel categories. And not that long ago, in 2022, uh, Mertens defines uh, DG quasi categories. Now, I have been saying that these are all models for DG categories, but that is stretching the truth a little bit. There are no proofs yet that these models are all quillin equivalent. The best we can uh, we have at the moment is that these two first models are equivalent to DG categories as quasi categories, which is less strong. And actually, none of these models have model structures yet. They are. Uh, they're um, work in progress at the moment. So we couldn't even start to uh, define a, a quillin equivalence for them yet. So if we have been uh, following this far, we can make a comparison between the infinity categorical set uh, set and the and the DG categorical uh, place. I'm still learning how to use this tablet. I'm sorry for the not very good writing. Um, so if we consider uh, simplicial categories to be the philosophical equivalent of uh, DG categories, we have several versions of quasi-categories in K-linear quasi-categories, enriched quasi-categories, or DG quasi-categories. We have a model, like we have a version of Siegel categories in our Siegel DG categories, but we don't have any versions of complete Siegel spaces. And that is where my work is going to uh, be. I'm going to try and fill this empty space here. Now, of course, this is not just an urge of my completionist heart that wants all boxes to be filled. There are other reasons why this might be a useful thing to do. So first of all, it is relatively easy to get a model structure on complete Siegel spaces. And logically, it will also be easy in the model I will define because we don't have to construct it from the ground up. On the other hand, to quote uh, Duggar, a, a complete SQL space is some kind of presentation by generators and relations, meaning that if we want, for example, to compute a functor from DG categories to another category, we could do it just by setting the images of the generators instead of having to define them for the entire category, which would be uh, 
pretty nice. And that would um, help us solve the question in particular of what the automorphisms of DG categories are. There's a paper back in 2004, if I remember correctly, by Bertrand Toen, where he does that this for infinity categories. He proves that the group of automorphisms of infinity categories is just z uh, over two. And we think we could do something like this in this case. So those are our reasons for trying to define a linear version of complete Siegel spaces. Okay, so now that the introduction is over, uh, the structure of this talk, uh, so this talk is going to be divided into four pieces. First, I'm going to start with some prerequisites. Uh, then we will define DG Siegel spaces, complete DG Siegel spaces, and give a couple of definitions and results about them. Then I will go in uh, into the proof of the equivalence. So why is this actually equivalent to DG categories? And then if I have the time, I will go into a couple of perspectives and future work that we're planning to do on this. Okay, so are there any questions this far? Is everyone okay? Okay. Then if we're going to talk about DG categories, the first we thing we need to do is define what a DG category is. So first for the entirety of this presentation, we fix k to be a commutative ring. And so we define a DG category to be a category enriched over the category of co-chain complexes. So I have been told that not everyone here is necessarily comfortable with this notion. So the idea is basically we have a set of objects, like a normal category. And then for every two objects, Instead, instead of having a set of morphisms, the morphisms between X and Y will be a co-chain complex. Okay? So those are our um, DG categories. And so a morphism of DG categories will be a morphisms of, of set, sets on the objects and for every two objects, a morphism of co-chain clump complexes. Okay. So that is what a DG category is. And I said that we have a model structure on it. So if we go into uh, have a model structure, then we need to, at the very least, define what the quasi-equivalence is. So I haven't given all the details here. So if we have a morphism of DG categories, we say that F is a quasi-equivalence if the induced map on the homotopy category is subjective, and for every two objects, the induced morphism on the level of the complex of morphisms is a weak equivalence. So just for the, the information, the homotopy uh, category is just the cohomology in degree zero of the, of the co-chain complex. So we recover a set from our coaching complex. Okay, so now that we have that, we have a theorem by Tabuada that says that the category of DG categories admits a model structure with these equivalences as their weak equivalences. And it's actually a cofibrinally generated model category. Uh, and now I'm going to give a couple of definitions of 
uh, objects that will be useful the, during the rest of this talk. So we denote by gr of C, uh, ck the category of directed graphs enriched over co-chain co complexes. So the idea is instead of having edges as arrows, we will have co-chain complexes or as our edges. And we can prove that there is equivalent adjunction between the directed graphs and DG categories. And we define a free DG category as being the image of this um, uh, adjunction. So basically, we just take the graph and add the compositions. And we denote the false subcategory of free DG categories by this L, libre, free in French. <laughs> then the other thing we're going to use is we say that a graph is of finite type if it has a finite number of vertices and the edges between two vertices are always perfect complexes. Now, you don't need to worry too much about what perfect complexes are. All that you need to keep in mind is that the category of chain complexes is accessible and the perfect complexes are in comp its compact objects. So in other words, we can write any graph as a co-limit of perfect complexes. And so our last definition is that we say that T is a free DG category of finite type. If it is a free DG category and the graph it comes from is a graph of finite type. Okay. Then our last prerequisite is this uh, uh, construction, which is Duggar's universal model category. Now, there is a lot of text on this slide because I wanted to give the full uh, theorem, but don't worry. Everything we're going to need to remember is that we have a category and a model category, and then we can always define a model category of this form so the countervariant functors from C to simplicial sets. And we can construct an adjunction like this from the model category to it. And remember that the sing uh, functor, so the one that goes from our model category to the universal model category, it's just a map. Okay. So that is the last of my prerequisites. So is everything clear? Are there any questions so far? Okay. So once the um, prerequisites are out of the way, we can start constructing things. And the first thing we're going to construct is the adjunction. So in the case of classical complete Siegel spaces, the adjunction we get is uh, of this form. So we have infinity categories on one side, and then our complete Siegel spaces will be uh, inside the contravariant functors from delta to simplicial sets. So taking this idea, what we are, are going to do is we're going to do, we're going to try and linearize this delta in a way. So our goal is going to be simplicial functors from this red thing here to simplicial sets. 
So first of all, what is that red thing that I just defined? Well, didn't define for now. Well, first of all, we have this full subcategory of cofibrant free DG categories of finite type. And we call it CL. Now, everything I'm going to be using over the course of this talk is going to be cofibrant. So I might forget to say it. I will forget to say it because cofibrant free DG categories of finite type is very long. So just assume that everything is cofibrant. And then what we're going to do is we take the set of quasi equivalences on DG categories. We construct a simplicial localization uh, with respect to this. And then we are, uh, define the simplicial CL to be the full simplicial subcategory whose objects are the ones in CL. So we're basically uh, giving a simplicial structure to this cofibrin free DG categories of finite type. So now we have all the ingredients we need in order to write, properly write this adjunction between DG categories and our functor space. So let me walk you through this diagram. So first we have these G, these are in a, induced by the um, inclusion. Then we have the L here, which is induced by the localization. And we have this uh, adjunction, which is given by Duggar's uh, universal model structure, where we have just taken both the category and the model category to be DG categories. Now you might be wondering why don't we just uh, compose all of these and just have a straight line. And the problem is that this L here goes in the wrong direction. So actually the um, adjunction goes like this. So the way we get around that is we're going to factorize our vector sing, our vector functor uh, sing, through this arrow here. So instead of just composing the entire thing, the vertical uh, arrow will just do this. And then the other arrow, we can just compose the way we wanted it to in that still works. Now, just for the intuition for this talk, you can just take sing of t to be map of blank to t, and that should get you through the entire presentation, no problem. So this is the functor that we will be interested in. So. Now, now that we have this, the next question is, what is the image of this functor? So, and for that, we're going to define DG Siegel spaces. So if we take a functor in this category, we say that F satisfies the DG Siegel conditions if it sends finite um, co-products to products, if it sends the initial object to a point, and then we have this small condition here. And for the moment, you don't actually have the means to understand this condition. I just wanted to 
write it down here for you to see. So now let me explain what that those symbols mean. So let G be a graph, uh, X and Y, two objects of the graph, and alpha in N co-cycle on G, X, Y. Then we define the graph G not alpha to be another graph which has the same objects as uh, G, the same uh, edges as G outside of X and Y. And for X and Y, we have the same uh, coaching complex, except that we add an object beta whose image by the differential is alpha. So in other words, what we're doing is we're killing our alpha in the homotopy category. And we can also write that in a more concise way by saying that G not alpha is the push forward of this diagram where Kn is a graph with two points and the um, complex between them is zero everywhere except in degree n. So let me. Uh, so the complex will be of this form. And uh, KCN is going to have two points and the complex in between them is zero except for the degrees and an n minus one, where it is k. Okay. So that is a way of defining G not alpha. And now we can go back to our definition of the DG Siegel conditions. So F satisfies the DG Siegel conditions if it sends finite coproducts to products, if the image of the um, initial object is a point, and if it sends the diagram from the last slide onto a homotopy pullback. If we have those properties, we say that F is a DG Siegel space, and we denote the full subcategory as DG Siegel. So uh, we said at the beginning of the talk that one of the reasons why it is interesting to use this point of view is because it is easy to find a model structure. And that is the case. Once we have gotten the right definitions, getting a model structure is relatively straightforward. We're just going to do a left pulse field localization. So there exists a simplicial models, uh, model structure whose vibrant objects are exactly the DG Siegel spaces. And we're calling that the DG Siegel model structure. Now, anyone who is uh, familiar with RESC's paper on complete Siegel spaces will have realized by now that we are doing something relatively similar to what he's doing. So uh, you won't be surprised to know that we stumble on the same issues that he had. In particular, uh, when he defined Siegel spaces, he realized that those were not enough to form a model for infinity categories because there was a, a type of morphism that should be invertible but it's not. And so to um, get around that, 
he defines complete Siegel spaces. And we have pretty much the same issue. Now, uh, in order to define complete Siegel spaces, what we're going to do is we're going to take inspiration in his uh, completion. So first of all, what is the relation between our DG Siegel spaces and his Siegel spaces? So we have a morphism that we call the linearization of delta between delta and our CLS. So what we do is we take the n simplex and we give it a um, DG category with n objects. And in between each two consecutive ones, we have a complex of morphisms that is zero everywhere except an on degree zero, where it's k. So that gives us a morphism between um, a delta and CLS, which allows us to define a quillen adjunction between the contravariant functors of uh, RESC and our functors. And we will call this functor here the delinearization morphism. And what does that give us? Well, it means that we haven't gotten too far from our original source. If we take a DG Siegel space and we delinearize it, we get a Siegel space in the classical sense. And that is what we're going to use in order to define complete DG Siegel spaces. We say that F is a complete DG Siegel space if it's a DG Siegel space and its delinearization is a complete Siegel space. Now, there is a way of defining these without going through the delinearization process. So in practice, we don't go to the classical um, setup in every situation, but I just thought this was an easier way to understand it. And we seem to be in the right direction. We were trying to find the image of the functor Sing, and we did. Every element in the image of Sing is a complete DG Siegel space. And now, again, we can find a model structure for this. It's another left path localization in which it, the vibrant objects are the complete DG Siegel spaces. And we call this model structure the complete DG Siegel model structure. Okay, but this construction has a tiny bit of an issue, which is that the weak equivalences are formally defined. I'm just saying that there are C local equivalences. So what are these? Well, we think it's the DK equivalences. So again, you don't have all the all that you need in order to understand this definition yet. I just wanted to uh, put it up to make you realize that this looks very similar to the definition of quasi-equivalences that we had in the case of uh, DG categories. And that is obviously on purpose. If both F and G are in the image of thing, what we have here is just the definition of quasi-equivalences in DG categories. So what is the general definition? Okay, let me walk you through this uh, definition. So first of all, we have DG mapping spaces. So if we have F a DG Siegel space and X and Y 
two points in the P0 of the image of uh, K. We defined a functor F x, y, a contravariant functor from uh, cofibrant coaching complexes to simplicial sets. And we define it in the following way. If we take E a perfect complex, F x, y of E is the homotopy fiber of this diagram, where E x, y is the graph of, with the digit category with two points and E as the complex between them. And once we have the um, image in all perfect complexes, because we said that we can write every complex as a co-limit of perfect complexes, we define the image of a chain coaching complex as the co-limit of the image of the perfect ones. That gives us a functor, and we call it the DG mapping space of F in X and Y. Now, this is a pretty convoluted definition, but don't worry, it is less hard than it seems because we have this result, uh, which is that every DG mapping space is representable. There exists a unique coaching complex such that fxy is just the map to a co that coaching complex. Now, of course, by Yoneda, that means that if f is sing of t, then this fxy is just t of xy. Because this is um, an ex exists and is unique, I will be calling in uh, both the functor and the coaching complex, the DG mapping space. So please tell me if it's uh, confusing, but it shouldn't add any dif difficulty in mathematical terms. So once we have that, we can define what the homotopy category is of a DG Siegel space. So we have a DG Siegel space, then we can define a category, the homotopy category of F, denoted by brackets F, by having a category whose objects are the pi zero of F in, uh, in K. So if at any point I talk about the objects of a DG Siegel space, that's what I'm talking about. And uh, for its morphisms, we take the um, uh, cohomology group in degree zero of the DG mapping space. And last, uh, now we have everything we need. We say that F is a DK equivalence if the induced map in the homotopy category is essentially subjective. And for every two objects in F, the induced map in the DG mapping spaces is a quasi-equivalence of co-chain complexes. So I said that these were the weak equivalences. And I do think that is true, but here is where the linearity of DG categories comes back to bite us. This is actually a lot more difficult to prove than we thought it was gonna be. So for now, it is a hypothesis. We see no reason why it wouldn't be true, but for now and for the rest of this talk, we're just going to assume that F is a DK equivalence if and only if it is a weak equivalence for the complete DG Siegel model structure.
Okay. So that concludes the section on constructions and results. And now we're going to go into the sketches of the proof of the equivalence with PG categories. And we're going to start with the fully faithfulness. So intuitively, the idea of this section of the proof is that it is relatively easy to prove that the functor Seng is fully faithful on three DG categories of finite type. So what we're going to do is we're going to take every DG category and we're going to chop it into tiny bits of finite type. And in order to do that, we're going to use hypercovers. Now, hypercovers are something that is being used in a lot of contexts. Uh, we have topological hypercovers, we have uh, hypercovers in simplicial sets, and they're usually always an augmented uh, simplicial object with some condition, some subjectivity condition. And we usually always have that the uh, homotopy co-limit of that augmented object gives us back the original one. So that is what usually happens with hypercovers. Now, the problem is that no definition, no existing definition of hypercover worked for our case. So we had to define our own. So let's do that. We have M a model category. We have M0 a subcategory of it. Then we define an M0 epimorphism to be such that for all X in M0, the induced uh, map, the induced morphism on the maps is an effective epimorphism of simplicial sets. In other words, that it is a morphism on the P0s. It's a uh, subjective on the P0s. Okay. And now, if we have an object in M and U star of X, an augmented simplicial uh, object in M, U star of uh, uh, U, uh, U star is an M0 hypercover of X. If for all N, we have that this functor is an M0 epimorphism. Okay, so we have a definition of hypercover in a model category, but is it, can we construct this in the case of DT categories? Well, we can. If we have a, a DG category, we can construct a free hypercover such that every element in the hypercover is also a free DG category. Now, if you read the definition, that is not exactly what I'm saying. In order for the uh, size of this thing to not blow up, uh, we have to uh, fix the set of objects, but that is just a technical thing. So I'm going to sweep it under the rug and pretend, pretend it's not there for the... So we have a free hypercover of every DG category. First thing we wanted. Second thing we wanted, if we have a free hypercover constructed as we uh, said, then we can prove that the homotopy goal limit of the hypercover gives us back the original object. So we have successfully chopped our DG categories. So first things 
first thing is done. Uh, second thing that we needed, the functor restricted to free DG categories of finite type is fully faithful. So now we, are there any questions? Um, see. Okay. So now we only need a couple of uh, special lemmas before we are uh, ready to do this thing. First, we prove that if we do the functor sing and then we do the homotopy co-limit, we get a decay equivalence. So we cannot prove in this case that this is a weak equivalence that, like we did in the context of uh, DG categories, but it is a DK equivalence. And then you might be wondering, I said I was going to chop this into three bits of finite type, but so far I have only said three hypercovers. And you would be right. I have been uh, only chopping them into three bits. And that is where this last lemma comes into play, which is that if we have a graph or coaching complexes, we can prove that there always exists a free a filter co-limit of it by uh, graphs of finite type. So we have chopped everything into three pieces, and then we can chop every one of the three pieces into three pieces of finite type. And that gives us enough information to give a sketch of the proof of uh, why this is fully faithful. So let me walk you through this diagram. So first of all, we have the homotopy co-limit of sing to sing is a DK equivalence. So assuming the hypothesis to be true, this is a weak equivalence. So it's imaged by uh, Re is still a weak equivalence. Now, Re is a right uh, adjoint, so it commutes with homotopy co-elements. So this is a weak equivalence. We have here three DG categories, so we can chop them into three DG categories of finite type. This is a weak equivalence. And lastly, because these are all three DG categories of finite type, then sing is, a, is fully faithful. And this is a weak equivalence. So by two out of three, this arrow here is a weak equivalence, and we have finished our proof. So our functor sing is fully faithful. Now, the last part is proving the essential subjectivity. So we have to prove that for every DG Siegel space, there exists a DG category whose image is DK equivalent to the DG single space. And I'm not going to go into much detail on this. The idea is pretty much the same. We're going to use a different kind of hyper cover to construct this uh, DG category T. So if we have F a DG Siegel space, we can prove that there exists a simplicial object in DG categories such that the image of that simplicial object is DK is a DG Siegel hypercover of F. Okay? 
haven't defined what a DGC of hypercover is, it is pretty similar to our last definition. So we have constructed a simplicial object in DG categories. And what we're going to do is we're going to take its homotopy co-element. So what we prove is that if we can construct a DG Seagull hypercover of this form, then the homotopy co-element of the simplicial object in uh, DG categories is the DG category that we need in this context. Is, the, uh, is everything clear so far? Okay. Now, of course, you will have noticed, uh, I am saying that this is a DK equivalence. So again, we need to prove that DK equivalences are actually weak equivalences for this to be a full proof of the essential subjectivity. But assuming the hypothesis to be true, then the functor sing is fully faithful and the sense is subjective. So we have a, a quillian equivalence and we have that complete DG Seagull spaces are a model for DG categories. And we have finished our proof. So uh, those are all the results that I wanted to talk about. So if I have a little bit of time, I can go into future work. I don't know exactly how much time I have left. Would you have 10 more minutes? Okay, perfect. That should be good then. Okay, so of course, our first uh, work should be to try and solve this hypothesis. So this is work in progress. I'm not going to go into detail of what option we have. I'm just going to give a, a sense of why this is actually hard. So as we have been following Resk's example, uh, well, with this construction, our first instinct would be to try and see how Resk solves this issue. And so what he does is he creates a completion functor. So he creates a functor that associates to every single space a complete single space, and then proves that every DK equivalence between complete DG single spaces is a weak equivalence. And that is a lot easier. Our problem here is that that um, completion follows this formula right here. And in order to define this, he uses the monoidal structure of um, simplicial sets. And as we said at the beginning of the talk, the monoidal structure and the model structure in DG categories are not compatible. So it's not that his proof doesn't work, is that his construction cannot be defined correctly in our context. So in order to do this, we would have to define a new monoidal structure in complete Siegel spaces that is in fact compatible with our model, so, uh, with our model structure. So this would potentially be easier in this uh, setting because Complete DG single spaces are functors on two simplicial sets. So we can potentially use that information from uh, structure from simplicial sets, but it's still not obvious. Our first idea would be to use day convolution, and that also doesn't work because uh, free DG categories are not closed under uh, products. So we are trying to work around these issues for the moment. But the good uh, news are that 
if we manage to define a monoidal structure for complete digital spaces, not only we would solve this hypothesis, but we would have a monoidal structure compatible with the model structure in DG categories, which would allow us to define proper, uh, properly some results in category theory that we just cannot state in DG categories right now. So that would be uh, pretty nice. Now on other uh, prospects, this is joint work with Arne Mertens and uh, Violeta Borges Marquez at the University of Antwerp. So I said in the beginning of the talk that there are other people doing other models of DG categories. So one question would be, can we compare those directly to one another without going through DG categories? So uh, Borges Marquez is right now working on a model based on uh, Seagull categories using Merten's uh, machinery. And we have been trying to find out whether we can construct something to go directly from her model to mine. And we have some preliminary results on that. So basically we say that this diagram commutes. Let me talk you through this. So we have DG categories go to complete Seagull, uh, complete DG Seagull spaces that we can delinearize to complete Seagull spaces. And at the bottom, we have DG categories going to her uh, DG Seagull categories, which would delinearize to uh, classical Seagull categories. And then there is a classical result comparing complete Seagull spaces to uh, Seagull categories. And we can prove that this diagram commutes. So at the very least, the delinearization of both models gets us to the same place, which if nothing is encouraging, <laughs> But of course, we didn't do all this work to linearize everything in order to delinearize it. So can we find something to compare them directly? Well, to this point, this is our best shot. So in a very hard wavy way, her, oops, Ura. I think I, wait, I, th I think I forgot, I lost my, uh -huh. okay. I touched something I shouldn't have and I lost my slides. Uh, okay, so her model, these uh, Seagull category, DG Seagull categories are collax functors from uh, delta to chain complexes. So what we thought we could do would be, we have the, uh, the theory that we could probably simplify my model instead of using three DG categories of finite type, using something a little bit smaller that is directed. And then we could, uh, so this is Dolcan we could try and meet in the middle by going to col colax delta k into simplicial sets. So this wouldn't give us a, a functor, but it would give us a, a zigzag of functors between complete Seagull spaces and uh, uh, DG Seagull categories. So what is that delta k? Well, it is what I, I like to call the linear simplex category. 
So if we fix a natural number and we fix two enuplets S and D like this, we call delta K and SD a DG category with n plus one objects. And for every two consecutive objects, a, com a complex concentrated in degree SI, where it is K to the DI. So in other words, it's a category like this, where uh, KDIS I would be a complex that is always zero, except in degree SI, where it is K to the DI. Okay. And we denote the full subcategory of DG categories composed of these things by delta K. Now, why do we think this is a good idea? Well, we have some reasons too. First of all, it would make the comparison with uh, Borges Marcus mo model a lot easier, but that is not the only reason. If you remember at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that complete digital spaces would give us a presentation by generators and relations. And the delta case would be generators a lot easier to use than free DG categories of finite type. And we have a few reasons uh, for that. So just for context, I will be denoting either by K or by Delta K, the DG category that has just one object just one object and an endomorphism K. Mm -hmm. So our first result is that all objects in Delta K are cofibrant. So considering that every DG category is fibrant, it means that every object in Delta K is both fibrant and cofibrant, which is Pretty nice. And also, if we have, uh, so we can uh, define a morphism from a delta K to a DG category in an explicit way. So how do we do that? But f first of all, if we have just the delta k zero that we and so yes, uh, and on the last slide, that just gives us the objects on uh, on T. And for any other, if we fix two points in our delta NSD, then we get this formula. So it's the products of all the uh, sets of co-cycles co uh, of degree SI. So this is something that is computed directly in co-chain complexes. So that would be interesting. And then lastly, we have that we can describe weak equivalences in DG categories using elements of delta K. We have that F is a weak equivalence if and only if the induced map from uh, delta K zero to F and the induced maps from delta k 1s1 to f are weak equivalences is in the shell sets. So if you realize we don't even need the entirety of delta k. So 
we have good reason to think that reducing to delta k would be interesting. But why do we think this is going to be the case? Well, first of all, all elements in delta k are already uh, oof, uh yeah are already cofibrant uh three dg categories of finite type. So we have the inclusion already. Then we have the fact that we actually use these delta k uh, one a and one in the definition of DG Siegel spaces. If you remember the definition of G not alpha used things of this form. Then we have the fact that the linearization of all deltas is still in delta k. And then the definition of a decay equivalences actually only cares for elements in, of this form. So we have good reasons to believe that these delta k's are actually the only things that we might need. So our hypothesis for the moment is that we can actually find a subcategory of com the complete DJ signal spaces that we defined that only uses this delta case. But that is work in progress. And I think I'm going to stop there. So um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So any questions or comments? So maybe I will ask one uh, or two oh, participants raised hands. Let me check. Who, who are they? I I did. So please, okay. yeah. Uh, uh, I want to ask. I mean, I just uh, stumbled upon uh, some uh, thing called Segal space objects. Uh, two of them actually. One of them was uh, kind of internal internalization of the. Uh, concept of Segal space by I think uh, Nima Razek paper. Oh, I can, yeah. I can send if you like. Uh, I mean, your definition does it uh, I mean, have any relations with the internalization of that? Uh, for example, international internal to I mean Segal space object internal to a, a DG category or DG algebra category of DGAs, can you, uh, I mean, if I define it like that, might be related or completely different? I am going to be honest with you. I, me, I guess probably yes, because uh, Nima works in things that are pretty similar. I have not read that article. So yes, please, if you can send it to me, I will appreciate it. Oh, it's a preprint. I can send it through chat if you like. Oh, yeah, uh, perfect. Here, archive. So, uh, okay. It has different purposes, of course, hmm. like universal you know, foundations, etc. cetera. Yeah. Hi, uh, Objects. He used uh, use it in uh, homotopy type theory. Yeah, I would probably have to look at it uh, okay. a little closer before I can say. It probably is related, but it was not intentional, so I doubt it. Uh, intersects completely. Um, but uh, I don't know if you have any 
<laughs> just an alternate, maybe just uh, another definition or, uh, or just another approach might be, I don't know. I actually didn't read the paper, but uh, just uh, I remember once uh, I was uh, looking, I just see that they are doing internally. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Let's go object. There are some things that ring really close. So I wouldn't be surprised if it was uh, if it would be possible to uh, explain one as the other. Mm -hmm. uh, Again, I am. Uh, I am just going through the article as we go. So, <laughs> I think there is one more question by Emre. I think you have a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question is: uh, What do we know about the uh, cofibration category structure on uh, DG categories? Um, or fibration category structure on DG categories? Can you please remind me what a cofibration category is? Uh, cofibration category is category equipped with a subclass of its morphism, which behave like cofibrations. Hmm. I'm not sure, actually. This is not something I have worked with directly. No. Uh, weaker structure than the model category structure. Yeah, I mean, all DT categories are vibrant. Hmm. So that is. Uh. <laughs> Damn it. Uh. <laughs> can, we, uh, can you repeat the question? Uh. Uh, uh, what do we know about the cofibration category structure on DG categories? Hmm. Uh, so the def uh, okay. uh, so the the co vibrations of these are of the form um so <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the co-fibration, the generating co-fibrations are things of this form as we, uh, the form we saw when we were defining uh, DG Siegel spaces. So we have these form and then We have a couple of other things. We can we can define them directly. And I I, I think I'm I, I I I'm not I, I don't know if I'm answering your question. It's okay. Uh, Thank you. You can uh, later on uh, send email <laughs> or post in our uh, 
e, seminar e, portal e, hmm. you can send email like that I mean that's okay I mean okay thank you <laughs> can I comment on that question sure <laughs> Maybe it's like a question, but um, it does, doesn't, I mean, if we have model category, we automatically get cofibration and vibration category. Am I right? Or not? Yep. Yeah. So she defined model category. So I, I, as I understand, so you should just take her cofibrations and weak, weak equivalences and make a cofibration category. Or yes, I mean take the vibrations and weak equivalences and make a vibration category. Unless vibration categories have more more than model structure, uh, but as far as I know, if you have model category, you automatically get vibration category and vibration category. So, yes. but I, I I I may be wrong here. But I'm just also asking. Uh, but the structure here will be different because the there is a structural construction. I think uh, not uh, uh, same object. I think. Mm. Uh, yeah. In, in that case, if there's extra things, then I, I don't know. So, okay. What do you mean? Not, not the same objects. Are you only taking the cofibrant objects, or and so? I mean, at, at least for cofibration category. Uh, Just for, I was thinking like for everyone to see the. Definition of a generated configuration is in double others papers. This one. Uh, for, for that model category, you get configuration category by you can do like this. Uh, there is a cylinder object, cylinder functor. You can get from this model category. Uh, I mean, you can you can define. I, I category, if you know I category, uh, it's a cylinder category. Hmm. Uh, from this model structure, using that, uh, uh, to prove that from I category, you can get cofibration category. Uh, I, I didn't give much detail, I know, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can just say, uh, you can get the cofibration category from this model structure by uh, focusing on the, the full subcategory of cofibrant objects. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I don't think there's a definition of the cofibrant objects in, in general, if that was what we're asking about. Uh, for the delta k, I had to prove it by hand that they were all cofibrant. So I don't think there's a a general definition of what the cofibrant objects are like. Uh, for this model structure, mm. uh, they are uh, retracts of semi-free DJ categories. Semi-free is like uh, the like they are free uh, free. As an algebra, and the mm. differentials are created somehow. Uh, mm. But anyway, yes. Uh, sorry for. <laughs> no problem. Doanchan, thank you. Uh, any more questions or comments? Well, maybe uh, we will uh, uh, stop our meeting, but with my last stupid question <laughs> so um, DG algebras are uh, very special case of DG categories right like classical yes, yes. Uh, have you worked out your thesis on that specific case 
Uh, no, I actually haven't. That might be a good way of seeing things. Just DG algebra is concrete, right? I mean, you can do many things in it uh, with your hands on doing lots mm. of computation. I mean, yes, that might be uh, an idea. Just DG algebras are so small, right? That I think they they might collapse I a see. lot of my uh, a lot of my structures. I see. So I might try and write it down, see where it goes. But right. I, I think it probably will collapse a lot of things. But at least you will see what things collapse and so on. I mean, <laughs> yes, it is never a bad idea to do computations yeah. on a simple okay. case. <laughs> um, so uh, let's thank our speaker once more. Uh, and thank you very much. I mean, it was a really very nice talk. I mean, you have written a very nice thesis. I mean, that mm -hmm. I realize. I mean, thank you. Uh, congratulations. Thank uh, you. So two weeks later, we will meet again. And now I will stop my recording.